Coming up on NTV, we'll take an inside look at Europe's biggest gas tank. There's been a real difference in the last two weeks because all of a sudden there is something visual. We'll be in China to find out how eight Dragon class ships are set to breathe new life into Grangemouth and Raffness. These ships will be groundbreaking. The project's actually moving things forward in a totally new dimension. INEOS Chairman Jim Ratcliffe answers some of your burning questions. Dennis and his team are working very hard to get the bio plant working by the end of this calendar year. From tanks to tackles, we'll see what some of the team here at Grangemouth do in their spare time. Yeah, catch the ball, there. Well, INEOS have been very supportive with an annual grant. And of course, we'll bring you the latest news and insight from INEOS, the word for chemicals. is in TV. Every month we'll be coming to you from a different site across the INEOS group and I'll be joined by a special guest presenter from the local plant. Today I'm with Jennifer Prentice, an award-winning chemical engineer. Hi Tom, it's great to be here. So there's an awful lot going on here at Grangemouth. Yes, there's lots going on and it's very exciting at the moment as we're getting the site ready for our first delivery of shale gas from the US next year. Let's take a closer look at that. The face of Grangemouth is changing with its largest ever investment programme. We're building currently what will be the biggest uh, ethane storage tank in Europe. The project is a very ambitious project because it's a major infrastructure challenge for the site. The tank will hold 30,000 tonnes of liquefied ethane gas shipped from the United States. It will provide a new source of raw material for the KG cracker to replace declining supplies from the North Sea. The cracker at the moment is running at less than 50% throughput and that's simply because we don't have access to the feedstocks and the quantities that are required to produce the, the tonnage that it was designed to produce. There's been a real difference in the last two weeks because all of a sudden there is something visual it's a very exciting project. It's very hard work, but we're actually enjoying it. The benefit of the renewed feedstock is going to be felt across the entire site. What this means for the polymer units is that we can actually increase the production volumes that we have here today up towards the design capability of those assets. INEOS are the only European-based assets that are actually looking to invest this amount of money in this type of technology to be able to grow sustainably in Europe and our customers absolutely love this. Here with me is John McNally, the CEO of ONP UK, one of the biggest petrochemical businesses here at Grangemouth. John, we've heard a lot about the new ethane tank that's being built, but what else is going on in the Grangemouth site? Well, quite a bit is happening on site, Jennifer. Uh, the ethane tank is securing the future of this site for the next 15 years to come. So that's the cracker behind us, but also the polymers units, the ethanol unit that's here. In August last year, we purchased the Fortin power station, which is behind us, uh, but that's providing power and steam for the site. It was in third party hands. We've now got it within our control and we're also getting a new office building. The road that we came in to get here has 19 different buildings that have groups of our team in it. So what we're doing is taking everybody out of those 19 buildings, putting them into one purpose-built building. And I think it's going to be really good in terms of the overall ambience here too, because we're going to get the whole team together for the first time since we formed OMP UK. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about this story is how the gas will be transported to here from North America. Revolutionary new ships are being designed that will transport the liquefied ethane both to Raffness in Norway and here to Grangemouth. The ships will dock at a brand new jetty to be constructed where I'm standing, from where the gas will move by pipeline to our new tank. So let's move across now to Shanghai and see just how this incredible feat of nautical engineering is progressing. On the east coast of China, at the estuary of the Yangtze River, Sino-Pacific Offshore and Engineering are constructing the massive gas cargo tanks. The tanks that are used for shipping ethane are made of high quality, high specification nickel alloy steels. 
to actually make those and have them fabricated to the size and scale required is one of the skills that's provided by the shipyards in China. Three bilobe hull optimised tanks will be located inside the hull of each vessel. Each will be capable of holding 11 Olympic swimming pools worth of supercooled liquid ethane. Transportation of liquefied ethane requires a special knowledge of how the gas reacts when transported. We need it to cool all the way during the transportation, during the loading and discharge operations. If you go from a bulk carrier to an LNG carrier, you are surprised by the density of piping system. So the design is complicated, it takes years, and this is what makes it very difficult. Three hours upriver at the Daiyang shipyard, the hulls are being assembled. Roughly, it's a, between one and two million man hours to complete one boat. Right now on the vessel, we have about 5,000 workers. The hulls of the boats are constructed in a steel block format, welded together to form mega blocks. Parts can weigh up to 700 tons, but must interconnect with the ultimate precision. Crucial moments for the build are probably lifting the cargo tanks inside for carrying the gas. These vessels are like 200 meter length and we have to be a couple of millimeter accurate. With the tanks now in place, the hull is made watertight and the boats are ready for launching. The eight Dragon class vessels will carry gas across the Atlantic on a scale larger than has ever been attempted before. These ships will be groundbreaking. The design is state of the art. These ships will be landmarks in the gas shipping environment. Now let's find out what else is going on across the Enios Group. Here in Scotland, INEOS is currently undertaking its biggest community engagement programme to allay fears the public have about shale gas extraction. We're going to be going out into community and speaking to people face to face, to as many people as we can. We're going to be going to community groups, we're going to be going to speak to anybody who will want to talk to us about this. In addition to the face to face, we're going to have some uh, short videos that will explain how this process works and allay their concerns. And so it's very important that we get out there and give people the independent evidence that this can be done safely. Our site in Cologne has been recognised by the European Commission for its energy efficiency. The EU Director General for Energy visited Cologne to find out how we are successfully controlling consumption. I think they took away that we are already doing a lot and that we are one of the cornerstones for energy efficiency initiatives. In the US, the INEOS ABS team and Styrolution North America have completed a deal to form one combined business entity. This new team will become North America's leading ABS supplier and be able to provide a broader portfolio of products to clients. After getting off to a flying start in Europe, the INEOS charity Go Run For Fun has now gone stateside with huge events involving 6,000 young children. Running in 12 schools throughout Houston, the events hope to encourage healthy diets and regular exercise. Probably one of INEOS's greatest assets is its people. Jennifer has been spending some time finding out some of the great things her colleagues get up to when they're not at work. Bill works as an infrastructure technical manager here at Grangemouth, but he's probably best known for his love of rugby. He currently manages the under-16s Falkirk Rugby team. I've been involved with Falkirk Rugby Club since the first Live Aid summer in 85, when I came through here as a student. I'm currently coaching the under-16s for the club. I need you to catch the ball. There. OK, we'll take the waste. Well, coaching's currently taking up basically three nights a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The most rewarding, I would have to confess, is working with the children. Basically seeing them develop into men and seeing their skills and attitudes develop. And ultimately, we became quite a successful team. First two men, back the ball, counter rock. We'll take Ryan away, OK? Well, Anius have been very supportive with an annual grant, which matched my time with a, an annual cheque, which allowed us to buy training gear. OK, full pace, make it good. 
Another Grangemouth colleague who really commits his time to his community is Craig Hanna. When he's not on shift working as a firefighter, Craig runs a youth music project called Cozy Blanket. My main focus at work is I work voluntary for a music project called Cozy Blanket Youth and Music Project. And our main aim is to provide musical opportunities for young people within the community. It's so important to me because it gives them opportunities for employment in the future. It gives them a focus in life, working with young people and music, two passions in my life, and I've managed to combine the both of them. The company here have been supportive to me as well with the funding and allowing me to do stuff. Now Tom, you must get stopped all the time with people asking you questions about what's happening in the group. Oh, I do Jennifer, I just wish I had some of the answers. But fortunately this week we did manage to catch up with Jim Ratcliffe and get Richard Longland to sit down with him and ask him some of those difficult questions. Thanks Tom. The first question we've got is from uh, Gary Gudak in the, in the States. It's a seasoned but ageing workforce in the United States. What plans do you have in place to attract and hire young talent? Um, we have a very comprehensive graduate recruitment programme now, both in the US and on the European side. I think Gary was it. I think Gary, you know, he has a point that it, it is ageing. If, if I look at many other modern companies today, you know, they're run by people in their 20s. You know, we don't have to wait until people are 35 or 45 before we give them proper responsibility. So that's very much my approach to graduates. And uh, next up, uh, Mel Smythe in Yes Enterprises. She's wanting to know where are we up to with waste to fuel technology. And we, we are still are believers in the technology, but the translation of pilot scale to full scale has thrown up a series of issues that we're still very positively disposed towards bio. Ourselves here in Europe and Dennis and his team are working very hard to get the bio plant working by the end of this calendar year and I think it's really important that we do that. Looking east, we've got a question here from Christoph um, uh, Boydens. Is Ineos still actively looking at opportunities in China and Asia? We are looking very carefully at Krill Nitrile. We spent quite a lot of time on phenol. But you need to invest wisely uh, and you need to safeguard your technology because, you know, there, there are occasions, as we all know, in China where the technology walks out of the door and you know, the lifeblood of INEOS is its technology, so you know, we'll always guard our technology extremely strongly. And a quick question from Ricky Labour in INEOS Oligomers at Laporte. He's interested in the $50 oil, in whether that's going to have an impact on, on INEOS's investment strategies. Well, the thing that dictates our profitability is the demand supply balance of our products. And the fact that our raw material has changed doesn't really change that. So, you know, if you take phenol, if, you know, the product's longer, the product's short, it will be profitable or it will be less profitable, and the same with the acrylic nitrile and what have you. The fact that oil's more or less expensive, I don't think will change the profitability greatly of those, those types of products. And uh, we have had uh, a number of uh, anonymous questions on, on, this, on this subject. You've been seen secretly watching uh, Chelsea matches, and uh, the, the rumour is that you might be sort of changing your allegiances. Mm -hmm. No, 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 I could, uh, no, never in my, ne never could I become a Chelsea supporter. Um, I, I have supported Manchester United since I could walk in the days of Charlton, Best, Dennis Law, um, and, and will forever remain a Manchester United supporter. And if you've got any questions for Jim, please get in touch. The contact details are on screen now. Well, it seems that's all we've got time for on this visit, Jennifer, so thank you very much for taking the time to show us around. It's my pleasure, Tom. And thank you all for watching. We hope you'll join us next time for the next episode of In TV. Goodbye. Goodbye.